Welcome to Strip Coverlet, where we squeeze the bigger picture out of literature. I am Adrian Fort, and we are here for another video, which will appear in two separate playlists here on the channel. Number one being the short story discussion playlist, but number two being the uh, Ernest Hemingway read-along. We are going short story by short story through the Finca Vigia edition, the complete short stories of Ernest Hemingway. This video will appear in both of those playlists, so if that's something in which you might find yourself interested, be sure to stick around for more. If you appreciate what I do here, hitting the like button really does help me out as it tells YouTube to share this video with other literature lovers. And this video will have three parts. A So What Happened, which is a summary of the short story, a literary criticism section, and a writer's corner section where we have a couple of notes we can learn from this short story as writers. So, what happened in this, The Doctor and the Doctor's Wife? There's a log boom in the lake by Dr. Adam's lakeside house. Crews had rounded up some of the logs to turn into lumber, but as they were towing the logs downstream, they lost a few of the logs. These logs washed up on Dr. Adams' beach. Dr. Adams knows that it's possible the logging company will come to retrieve these lost logs, but it's probably not worth the money the company would have to pay a crew to come out and retrieve them. They will, if they are not collected, waterlog and become worthless. So he figures he may as well salvage them. In turn, he hires some of the local Native Americans to come out and help cut the wood, one of whom, Dick Bolton, is probably looking to start a fight and does so. So, the doctor tells them, forget it go home. And they do. They go home. And he does as well. He goes inside. And he's in a huff, and in his huff, uh, almost starts a fight with his own wife in the process. He decides he's too angry to be inside, and yeah, maybe, if depending on how you read the story, he's too angry to be inside and being badgered by his wife, uh, depending on how you read the story, right? depending on how you interpret what's going on there, right? Uh, probably he's too angry to be inside and be answering questions, regardless of how you define badgered. Um, so he goes out on the deck, but before he really settles outside, his wife tells him to tell Nick, their son, Nick Adams, by the way, one of the recurring characters in Ernest Hemingway's short stories, says to tell Nick that she is looking for him. So he goes and he finds Nick, and he says that, uh, look, your mother's looking for you. Nick, who's reading, says, but I, I don't want to go with her. I want to go with you. Uh, Dr. Adams says, okay. And Nick tells him, I know where to find some black squirrels. So his father suggests they should go and find some black squirrels. That is the summary of the short story. So what, what are we talking about when we talk about the doctor and the doctor's wife? Well, there's a few things worth talking about in this short story. And this is definitely one of those short stories that in today's sentiments will come across, across in quite the rough fashion. So I've got this the one, two, three, the fourth paragraph in the short story reads as such. Nick's father always assumed that this was what would happen and hired the Indians to come down from the camp and cut the logs up with the cross saw and, the spl and split them with a wedge to make cordwood and chunks for the open fireplace. Dick Bolton walked around, walked around past the cottage down to the lake. There were four big beech logs lying almost buried in the sand. Eddie hung up the saw by one of the one of its handles in the crotch of a tree. Dick put the the three axes down on the little dock. 
Dick was half was a half breed, and many of the farmers around the lake believed he was really a white man. He was lazy. He was very lazy, but a great worker once he started. He took a plug of tobacco out of his pocket, bit off a chew, and spoke in Ojibwe to Eddie and Billy Tabashaw. That is definitely a paragraph that is sort of rough by today's sentiments, calling someone a half-breed, uh, referring to Native Americans as Indians, right? All of these things. Uh, then there is the, so there is a bit of a, if you were taking this as a racist paragraph, as a racist text, there's a bit of a misnomer there, though, because there is the, the, stere the there was a lazy Indian stereotype, uh, which was one of the stereotypes about Native Americans. However, Hemingway says that uh, this, Dick Bolton, this Dick Bolton character, everybody kind of thinks he's white. So once he's thrown out the stereotype about the race, then he says, well, yeah, but everybody thinks he's white anyway. So that's, even though that is not quite the, the stereotype as it had appeared, uh, it's still something that is being it's still something that is being pointed at in the short story as something the reader would probably know about. It's an assumption you would probably make if you're reading this text, right? That there are there the lazy Native American, right? So that's sort of the that's sort of the um, that's sort of the meaning of what is being said is that it's assuming you will know that stereotype but here's here's a question i want to ask and it's sort of a genuine question how much of this rough paragraph and there there are some other rough things that pop up in the short story for sure that you could point to if you wanted to how much of this rough paragraph should we accept as an historical document. That is to say, this is the way it was when this short story was being written. There is nothing that would have been uncommon at the time this short story was written. How much of it should we accept in that fashion by, by saying, okay, this is how this document exists with these ugly things in it, by accepting this document as this ugly thing with these ugly things in it, that's the only way we can be sure that we won't perpetuate these things in the future. A lot of, and I'm going, I'm not, this is not a political channel, right? But one thing that's almost impossible not to look at in today's political landscape are so many lessons from the past not being learned. So many things that we have seen before and said, oh, oh, that doesn't work. They're popping back up and people who have remained or purposely become ignorant of history have said, oh, well, you know, and I'm, I'm not making an argument from either side with this because there, I mean, there's two sides, right? There's only two sides. You, you can't look at anything in a robust fashion in today's world. It is yes or it is no. But so many of these things are popping back up and we're refusing to recognize them in their historical context because, well, if you know the historical context, that makes you some type of ist. That makes you some type of phobe. Um, but no, you want to know the history. So I think that there is a very big argument to be made for, yeah, th this is an ugly paragraph, right? Um, there are a couple of things that pop up in the story that are ugly in general. You want to know them. You want to know them. Uh, and, and past that, how much of this should we be? Re so Hemingway often gets this sort of browbeating in today's, uh, context. If you read some of Hemingway's thoughts, he would have been extremely progressive for his time. 
uh, if you read, especially if you read some of his thoughts on God, right? So some of these things would have been extremely progressive for his time, but we have to mention Hemingway as a racist. We have to mention Hemingway as a sexist, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But how much are we in the context of the story to take as Hemingway's flaws? And how much of it are we to take as a close psychic distance with Dr. Adams? That is to say, how much of this are we to accept as Dr. Adams being being of his time, essentially, but being, how much are we to take of this narrative as inside Dr. Adams' head? That is to say, the use of the word Indians. That's Dr. Adams, not Hemingway. Uh, the use of the term mixed breed, half breed, what was it? Uh, half breed. How much of this are we to take as Ernest Hemingway labeling a person a half breed? And how much of it are we to accept as it being Dr. Adams who is saying these things? Uh, I think that that is an interesting question, especially if we are looking at things in the context of new criticism. That is to say, there is nothing outside of the text that we have to understand in order to make an interpretation of the text. If we are taking the text as the supreme document in its own interpretation, as the uh, indeed as the exclusive document in its own interpretation, if we are taking that approach, then this ugliness, I think, is essentially the ugliness of Dr. Adams. Moving on, we get this um, number two on the lit crit list there. Dick Bolton turned to Nick's father's. Nick's father. Well, Doc, he said, that's a nice lot of timber you've stolen. Don't talk that way, Dick, the doctor said. It's driftwood. Eddie and Billy Tabashaw had rocked the log out of the wet sand and rolled it towards the water. Put it right in, Dick Bolton shouted. What are you doing that for? asked the doctor. Wash it off. Clean off, and the, sa clean off the sand on account of the saw. I want to see who it belongs to, Dick said. The log was just a wash in the lake. Eddie and Billy Tabashaw leaned on their cant hooks, sweating in the sun. Dick kneeled down in the sand and looked at the mark on the scaler's hammer in the wood at the end of the log. It belongs to White and McNally, he said, standing up and brushing off his trousers' knees. The doctor was uncomfortable. You'd better not saw it up then, Dick, he said shortly. Don't get huffy, Doc, said Dick. Don't get huffy. I don't care who you steal from. It's none of my business. If you think the logs are stolen, leave them alone and take your tools back to camp, the doctor said. His face was red. Now, in the internet pop culture of things, this is what Jordan Peterson has referred to as a disagreeable male. Um... Dick had decided he was absolutely going to start this fight when he woke up in the morning. And by God, he started it. <laughs> so from a storytelling standpoint, from a literary criticism standpoint, what's interesting here is the dynamic of things. We get later that Dr. Adams believes that Dick started this fight so that he wouldn't owe Dr. Adams any money. Maybe. But the real question here is the question of culture. So, I, I mean, obviously, and we'll get back to this in the writer's uh, corner portion of the video. This is an individual, Dick Bolton, who was absolutely going to start this fight this day. And that that's the act of an individual. But when we take the greater concept, the sort of superseding concepts uh, at play here, what we have is a Native American who had been, who, who doctor, a white man, Dr. Adams, had helped 
needing to be repaid, that is putting a stressor on Dick. Society writ large has put stressors on Dick because Native Americans were looked down on, etc. So the help that Nick's father, the doctor, had given to basically everyone from the Native American camp from time to time. We got this in, in the previous video in this series, Indian camp, is not seen as just, is not seen as Dr. Adams doing what Dr. Adams does. It is, and maybe rightfully so, interpreted as the white man looking down on us. So that is sort of the, the meta of what's going on with this interaction. But we don't get from this story or from Indian camp any reason to believe that Dr. Adams really does think this way about the Native Americans. However, there's no reason really not to think that way either. So while the, the terms and terminology levied at the Native Americans by Dr. Adams, it's pretty racist. It would not have been seen as particularly out of tune in his time, right? So the social dynamics in which this story is set are such that Dr. Adams is probably completely unaware of tone and tonality, but he's, he, so it's sort of the, the sort of racism, the sort of same racism as the white man's burden, right? Dr. Adams needs these things done. He thinks, oh, why don't I throw a couple quarters to the Native Americans and get this stuff done? Probably this is mostly because of class, right? But a lot of it is going to be interpreted. So if, for example, at this time, if there had been a neighborhood of Irish folk down the street, Dr. Adams probably would have made the same gesture towards them as the Native Americans. Let me throw these fellas a couple of quarters. I'll get the work done, etc. It's condescending. Certainly it's condescending. In that context, it would be seen as classist. But to Dr. Adams, he would have absolutely no idea, probably, of the interpretation of the sort of connotation of what it is that he's doing. And even if he did, would that Irish family, would that Native American family be better off with a day's work and the money or not having the work, not having the money, right? It's an interesting sort of conundrum there from person to person. Personally, I went through a little bit of this at the college level with um, professors who had all good intentions at heart, but offered me manual labor jobs because I was not really of the class that goes to college very often. And it was probably pretty obvious. But still, at the end of the day, I felt condescended, but I did need the money. So it was I condescended uh, without really the um, ability to complain about it, I suppose. On the next page in the Finkavigia edition, in the cottage, the doctor sitting on the bed in his room saw a pile of medical journals on the floor by the bureau. They were still in their wrappers, unopened. It irritated him. 
this is an interesting note about Dr. Adams. Dr. Adams wants the driftwood out of the lake by his house. Dr. Adams wants the wood for himself. Basically, he's salvaging it, but still, he wants the wood for himself. He's not willing to do all of the work. He might not be willing to do any of the work. We never have a, a, an image of him carrying his own tools. Dr. Adams is a doctor. The very next paragraph, his wife says to him, are you going back to work? And he says no. So that he's not going back to his job that day. But he's also not doing his research. And we know that because all of the medical journals are piled up in his bedroom still in their wrappers. So what is Dr. Adams really about? Is Dr. Adams really about anything or is he checked out? It seems that his... So uh, let me go to number four here. On the next page, the doctor went out on the porch. The screen door slammed behind him. He heard his wife catch her breath when the door slammed. Sorry, he said. Outside her window with the blinds drawn. It's all right, dear, she said. He walked in the heat out the gate and along the path into the hemlock woods. It was cool in the woods on such a hot day. Even on such a hot day, he found Nick sitting with his back against a tree reading. Your mother wants you to come and see her, the doctor said. I want to go with you, said Nick. His father looked down at him. All right, come on then, his father said. Give me the book, I'll put it in my pocket. I know where there's black squirrels, Daddy, Nick said. All right, said his father. Let's go there. Maybe Henry Adams has checked out. Maybe Dr. Adams is not really about anything except for his son. He seems to be kind of a little bit absent in his marriage. He seems to be dismissive of the Native Americans around him. He seems to be completely removed from his career as a doctor, not even reading the medical journals anymore. What is he about? He's about his son. Well, in the grand scheme of things, in the meaning of life scheme of things, we can make two contributions, really. We can make a contribution to society at large. You dedicate yourself to literature, for example, and end up writing the next great American novel. That's a great contribution. Maybe you dedicate yourself instead to your family. One of the greatest, one of the greatest things that you can do as a family man is rear the next generation, rear the next generation of men to be responsible, rear the next generation of women to be responsible. That seems to be where Nick's father is at right now. He has decided that the most rewarding contribution he can get from life at this point is his son. Now, moving on to the uh, writer's corner portion of things. This short story has a lot of stuff to explain at first. We don't know the situation. We don't know the characters. We don't know the dynamics between the characters. We don't know the setting. We don't know anything at first, just like with any short story, right? But this is the first paragraph we get. The opening paragraph is this. Dick Bolton came from the Indian camp to cut up logs for Nick's father. He brought his son, Eddie, and another Indian named Billy Tabishaw with him. They came in through the back gate out of the woods, Eddie carrying the cross-cut saw. It flopped over his shoulder and made a musical sound as he walked. Billy Tabishaw carried two big cant hooks. Dick had three axes under his arm. All of this stuff to explain, and what we do is we jump right into the story with a couple of characters, three characters, in movement. That wraps, that sort of drags us in immediately as a reader. That is a great place to start. Uh, and this may seem like wasting words, especially in a short story that's probably, I would wager to bet, under a thousand words or right at a thousand words. 
But when you are getting your reader into motion immediately, it ends up not being wasted words. It ends up being what gets your reader's feet moving. Your reader's feet moving sucks us in to the rest of the short story because we're already reading. We've already got some things to look at, some places for our mind to go. We might as well keep going. And the last note there, I want to jump back to this. Dick Bolton turned to Nick's father. Well, Doc, he said, that's a nice lot of lumber you've stolen. Don't talk that way, Dick, the doctor said. It's driftwood. Eddie and Billy Tabashaw had rocked the log out of the wet sand and pulled and rolled it towards the water. Put it right in, Dick Bolton shouted. What are you doing that for? asked the doctor. Wash it off. Clean off the sand on account of the saw. I want to see who it belongs to, Dick said. The log was just a wash in the lake. Eddie and Billy Tabashaw leaned on their cant hooks, sweating in the sun. Dick kneeled down in the sand and looked at the mark on the scaler's hammer in the wood at the end of the log. It belongs to White and McNally, he said, standing up and brushing off his trousers' knees. The doctor was very uncomfortable. You'd better not saw it up then, Dick, he said shortly. Don't get huffy, Doc, said Dick. Don't get huffy. I don't care who you steal from, it's none of my business. If you think the logs are stolen, then leave them alone. Take your tools and go back to camp, the doctor said. His face was red. Everybody knows this guy. I know this guy. We all know a that guy. But here's the brilliant part of this writing. The guy who's starting the fight in this argument later on, ends up being the same guy who says, no, let's keep working. Let's keep going. The guy who say, the guy who starts the fight about stealing the wood is the guy who says, I don't care who you steal from. That, the guy who starts the fight wants to keep working. That creates an incredible dynamic and tension in this, because it's the guy then who wants the work done, Dr. Adams, who says to the Native American fellow who started the fight, to Dick Bolton, he says to him, go home. I don't want your help. Go home. That is a great way to continue the tension. And then, as a reader, this story gets even bigger because we have to imagine in our minds Dick Bolton on the walk home with Billy Tabashaw and his son, neither of whom get the work, neither of whom are earning money that day. They had made the walk. It's a hot day. They made the effort. They got out. And now Dick started this fight and none of them get paid. That is, as a writer, an incredible way to build the dynamics in your story. Conflicting interests. Dick Bolton gets out. He wants to start that fight. Dick Bolton starts that fight. And he also says, no, nah, let's keep working. Dr. Adams wants these Native American fellas to cut this wood up for him. Dr. Adams gets slapped in the face by the, uh, the accusations from Dick Bolton. Dr. Adams, who wants the wood cut up, then says, get out of here, fellas. That is dynamic tension. We can all learn from that. That is, that's masterful storytelling. Any time you can get your characters to have interests contrary to their actions, we, as the reader, get an incredible little morsel to chew on. That is all I have for this short stories discussion. If you like or appreciate what I do here on the channel, hitting the like button really does help me out as it tells YouTube to share this video with other literature lovers. And if you find yourself here by chance but not design, consider hitting the subscribe button in order to stick around for more. There is poetry every Monday here on the channel. There are multiple videos per week. I am currently going through uh, both Ernest Hemingway's Fink of Asia edition as well as Dubliners by James Joyce. But I'm also reading through... Um, Sylvia Plath's collected poems. So there's a lot of stuff going on on the channel, and I hope to have you back for the next one.